Hi. Um, so um, I know a little bit of uh, Mandarin, but uh, it's really, really bad. So I'm, I'm, this is why I present, I'm going to present in English. But um, do feel free to speak slowly if you want to ask me a question in Mandarin, OK? Oh, by the way, um, if you want a link to the um, presentation, that's the QR code. So I'll just leave it on there for a couple of seconds for people to take a snap. Okay. Got it? Right. All right, who am I? Um, so it's uh, pretty good that the uh, IBM guys just spoke. So my first graduate job was in uh, IBM. I was a J, uh, JVM developer, and um, I was uh, responsible for doing um, J9 JVM. And in fact, it has been recently open sourced, and I have found my piece of code that I wrote about 25, well, not 25 years ago, about 20 years ago. So I'm quite chuffed. It's still there. <laughs> um, so it does say that I write good code that last 15 years. OK, so you can have a look at that. Um, that's the link for the OpenJ9. Um, and then after I left IBM in 2005, I've joined a large financial, multinational financial firm, which shall not be named. Um, and I was running their infrastructure team, looking after all the Java SE and Java EE. And then recently, I've left that job uh, after 10 years. And now I'm a senior Java developer at another financial firm. And I'm afraid they not allow me to use their name in presentation. So they shall be main, nameless. <laughs> uh, but if you go to my, if you want to contact me, you can go to my LinkedIn page and you can work out who they are. OK, um, so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to go through um, Java 9 features that you might not know about that you that I think people will find it interesting. Um, and that because I, if you look at the schedule today, you have seen J shell, you have seen modules and things like that. If I start talking about those, you guys will be bored. So I'm going to pick a couple of features in Java 9 that you might or might not know is there that's quite useful. I'll talk about how, how um, you can use it. Um, why they are there, the philosophy behind it from a JVM developer point of view, and um, give you some hopefully give you some insight into how JVM um, sort of like you know, how the JVM API and things like that put together. Okay, um, so I'm sure you have seen quite a few presentations about Reactive, um, so I'm not going to talk huge huge amount about it, um, but what I'm going to say is that basically. They have implemented the Reactive API, the, the interfaces, in the JVM. Um, so it will be working similar to how JPA works. So in JPA, the Java standard community defined a set of interfaces on how you do JPA. But then you can have Eclipse toppling, you can have Hibernate, you can have all different kinds of implementations. Um, so the Reactive API in the JDK 9 is going to be a skeleton implementation, and then it will be up to whatever you use it for, database driver or HTTP driver and things like that, to implement it. Um, I'm going to show you an example on how this reactive interface is, um, is going to look like in, in one of the um, Java API in, the, in a minute. So it will give you a sense of what's going on. OK. Um, anybody went to a reactive talk this morning? Yeah, some, not all of them. So basically, it's an idea of combining like an iterator and a listener, a asynchronous listener, uh, into one really simple API. Um, so you can process a piece of data like a stream. And then basically, you have um, um, an asynchronous uh, processor and, and a subscriber to process them. And then basically, um, the important thing about the Asian, um, Reactive API is that it has um, things to deal with back pressure. So if your producer is generating more than your subscriber can produce, what are you going to do? So it has, um, it has some um, tools to actually deal with those. Okay. So as I said, JDK9 have some have the standard API. Now, 
a lot of the libraries like Acre and Alex Java, they haven't, they, they're starting to implement the same API. So what happens is that if you write against uh, Acre and, and Rx Java or other types of reactive um, programming framework, it will also work in the, J, uh, in the J, JDK. Okay, so this is what the, um, the, the reactive interface looks like in JDK 9. Um, it's called Flow, it's Java Util Concurrent Flow. And basically it's got three pieces of um, uh, components. So you have a publisher where you publish your information. You have a subscriber where they listen to the um, subscribe, um, listen to the publisher, whatever publish, push, publisher pushes out. So basically, when you initiate a subscriber, you subs you, uh, you call the um, publisher to do a subscription, and you can request how many objects you want or cancel if you can't deal with it anymore. And then what happens is that when this producer, uh, whether it's a file reader or database or whatever, it's got some data to send back to the subscriber, it will call a number of callbacks, call on X, on error, et cetera. And that's how they communicate. And then basically the publisher can control how much stuff that they push through using the um, event, event caller. So it's not like the subscriber keep polling um, the publisher. So basically make it more efficient. And then a, the pair of publisher and subscriber together is called a processor basically, which is a, 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 a shows you a stage. So um, let's take a look at examples. So now you've got an idea of how the API is being organized. Let's take a look at the, an actual example in the JDK that um, they implement this reactive API, okay? Um, there's actually a couple of things that's already in the new JDK 9 that's already reactive. So one of them is, the, is this incubating HTTP2 web client. Um, so you can make requests to the uh, HTTP servers and things like that using the built-in uh, incubating um, client. Um, there's also uh, another one which just slipped out of my mind. Uh, I'll, if I remember, I'll talk to you about that. Um, okay, so this HTTP2 client is actually in incubating stage. It's, it's in a package in the module called JDK Incubator. What that means is that um, in the future version of Java, so the interface is not completely fixed. In the in future version of Java, they might change or remove or things like that. Um, so they want people to provide feedback and see whether they are suitable for what, what people want to use it for. Um, so this is the way that they're going to develop API in the future, is that they put in incubator and then incubating a, a modules, and then basically, um, if they like it, then they become official. Okay, this new client, um, um, anybody uses the JDK client, web client before, HTTP request client before? Wow, it's so terrible that nobody use it. <laughs> so, well, I presume everybody use Apache HTTP client and things like that, right? Um, but yeah, P, the JDK developer realized it's quite terrible and it's very difficult to extend to things like HTTP2 support where you've got multiple streams and things like that. Um, and things like WebSocket, um, they want out of, out of the box support for those. So that's why they rewrote the HTTP2 client, okay? And the really interesting thing is that they actually use the Flow API for the um, asynchronous access. So in HTTP2, you can have multiple uh, streams and you can have a, a stuff that transmit in the, in the background. So you don't have to wait for um, the request. Um, so it's used the Flow API paradigm. Um, so it's a very good example of how you could actually use it um, and, or, or how, how people would implement it. Okay, so there's two things. So we map back to the flow API diagram that we had before, right? So in the um, request size, when you send a request to the server, um, what happens is that you are allowed to um, do a, a, a request uh, body processes, which is basically takes a bunch of byte buffers. So if you want to send multiple streams um, to the web HTTP server, you can actually implement them as a different um, processor. They, it's actually wrong term. It's actually um, it's actually publisher, but they call it processor, which is terrible. But uh, well, they have got a chance to change it. 
So you can think of, so remember the green boxes is basically the publisher. So basically, if you've got multiple requests that you want to make to the server, you can implement them as uh, multiple um, uh, uh, things in publisher. And then again, you can, and then the, the, the HTTP client actually subscribe to, to, to your publisher, but then it's hide all behind you, like, et cetera. Okay. On the other way around, when the HTTP client, um, when the HTTP client already make a request from the server and they have multiple streams and things like that, again, they, the HTTP client become a publisher and then your, you can actually implement your own uh, subscriber a, into, the, um, into the request. So you can actually take a look at the different streams and things like that, okay? So let's take a look at a, an, an example on the, how you do it. Okay, um, so in a very simple way, so obviously you don't have to, a lot of times you just want to make a request uh, to a HTTP server and then just forget about it, right? So um, they have got a really simple API and builder so I can, we can actually try that. So again, um, I'm sure everybody went to the JShell presentation this morning? Or is it too early? <laughs> um, so JShell, if you haven't went to the presentation this morning, it's basically the uh, repo interface, which allows you to do rapid prototyping and things like that, so which is quite good. So, um, so I'm gonna do, I'm gonna try this example. So first we create a client. Um, we tell it to, um, what happens is that now all this Google and Twitter has all redirects. So you have to set up all the follow redirects, otherwise just give you say, send you, uh, give you the result that send you to different uh, different um, server. So this is why we have follow redirect, but literally just a builder. Okay, so let me make the font bigger. Find the bits where they have set a font. Better? Can people in the back see? Well, maybe. Okay, so now let's stick it in there. So now you create you create a client, okay? And then basically now you can make HTTP requests. So what you do is you want to search for whatever. So let's say search for J JCC con, and then um, just a normal get request, okay? And then Stick in there. Here we go. So now we generate a request. So you can set all the different parameters. You can do polls. You can do all sorts of other things. You can want to add other streams, and you can do that. But obviously, just a quick demo. So now, once you've done that, then now you can actually make your actual request. So you actually ask the client to send the request. Um, notice that this is uh, there's a, uh, a kind of a uh, uh, sort of like uh, helper interfaces. For you, so instead of making you to write all this sort of like you know, publisher and subscriber and things like that, they have a really handy um, uh, helper for you. So you don't have to write all the function. But I'll show you an example of how you actually would go about writing one of those uh, in a minute. But um, we'll use we'll use one of the helpers. Okay, so now that will actually call the web server. Uh, to Google, so this is why it takes a bit of time, um, and should should work. Here we go. I'm sure a lot of you are browsing the internet. That's why it's so slow. Um, so finally, it got response. 
And then you can now look at the um, body, the, the, uh, the status quo. Um, so, response. Spelling. So, so I can look at the status quo. So that's 200 means great. And then, and then we can do body, which uh, remember we here we actually set a uh, we, we actually set a helper interface. So the body is actually re represented a string, but you can actually change it. There, there helpers for making it the file and things like that. So obviously, as a demo, it's probably the easiest thing to do. Here you go. So that's your Google front page. Um, obviously, it's got all the other bits and pieces. So this is why it looks a bit funny not not having all the usual Google stuff. Uh, but that shows you it actually makes a uh, request to servers and things like that. Okay. So now I've I've used um, in in the example just there I've used uh, the the helper interfaces so you don't have to do the publisher and subscriber. So how would one go about actually writing something like a subscriber? So I've got a little bit more advanced example um, in here. Which is basically what a um, what what the processor looks like, and remember um, in the previous slide um, I said there's a, so there's a subscriber there's a there's a on next on error and on complete, okay. So so basically you implement the uh, body processor interfaces, and and basically these are. If you look at that, it's it's uh, um, these are actually flow subscriber, okay? I'm afraid a bit small. They they they're basically a subscriber, um, a flow subscriber basically. So now you you uh, implement all this um, the interface as uh, expect. So when you subscribe, um, which is basically you tell the publisher to say, okay, register me as the um, uh, as as the um, uh, as, as a subscriber to the publisher. Um, and then what happened is that um, that encapsulated this subscription object encapsulated all the um, uh, all the parameters that you want to do um, and, and the control interfaces. So what happened is that once you make the subscription, then you um, you say you request the amount of data. So you can actually um, request as much as you want, but I just pick one k as my example. Okay. Now and then what would happen instead of the subscriber, remember the subscriber will call on next as an event, so that would that would call it on next. Um, and then in here, um, this, uh, by the way, you can see that, that in the back if it's a bit too small. Um, but, and then once you call it on next, basically I just collect, uh, and, and it would actually give you all the items um, in the, in the uh, interfaces. Um, and then what happens is that I just gather them into a uh, into a uh, byte array buffer. This is probably not the most efficient implementation, but it's a very good example to show you how to actually make one. You can probably make a better um, uh, better implementation for this. And then finally, if you want to deal with error, you can deal with it. Um, once all the data has been delivered, it will call it on complete. And then at that point, you can actually um, you can actually do the, uh, it's, it's a future, so you can actually do a, a complete, uh, send the result as a complete. And then you, uh, the get body is basically just a provide interface for the HTTP client to sort of like, you know, return the results, okay? So if we run this, oh, and, and I'll show you the difference here. So instead of making it a to us string, um, you can actually have a different processor for the um, request. So I, at the moment, I check for status code is 200, but you can actually do a switch statement, and then you can, if you want a 300 redirect, want to do something else, or if you have an error, authentication error, the HTTP status code, if you've got different status code, you can deal with it uh, in a different way. You can, you can basically just pass a lambda in there. Um, so obviously, I just deal with this success case because um, I'm not going to write this sophisticated thing for demo. So you can see that it's actually read the data and printed exactly the same thing. Okay. Right. 
Um, and so that's the reactive uh, interfaces, and there are other API. So now that it's part of the um, part of the J JDK API, it will be used in in futures when they have to um, deal with all this kind of requests. I think the next candidate that they're probably going to do is things like JDBCs to have asynchronous drivers uh, and things like that. Um, so you will get to see this interface being used more and more. Um, so hopefully, uh, won't be uh, something I know you see quite often. Okay. Right. So that's the uh, reactive interfaces. Now let's take a look at all the other tiny um, changes that's going on in the language. Um, one. So in Java seven and Java eight, Java seven mainly. Um, is introduced uh, something called the Project Con, which allows you to do um, things like uh, 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 using underscores um, to specify your um, yeah, numbers and things like that. And th these are generally small changes to language that doesn't break um, uh, sort of backward compatibility. Um, and what happened is that um, there are sort of like improvement that you can make in the Java languages that doesn't really um, sort of like you know, causes a huge amount of changes or class file changes and things like that, and that's um, Project Con. Um, so there's a couple of things uh, things that they have actually added in Java 9. Um, so for example, this is one of the example. Um, it's driver resources, which basically automatically close the stream. Um, for effectively final variables. So in Java 7 and 8, if you want to write, if you want to copy two streams, you will probably want to write something like, so I you know you create a streams and things like that. But what happened in Java 7 and 8 is that you are not allowed, uh, you, you have to declare the variables inside a try block. So you, in Java 7 and 8, you have to write it like the top way. So you have to create your stream and then you do, um, you create another variables and then you, Use, use the other ones. Um, that's clunky and difficult. Okay, what happened in Java nine is that um, if your F one and F two never changes after after you declare them, that um, what the, uh, Java language will call it, recognize it as a effectively final. So you only assign it once and you never change it in your body of your method. If that variables is effectively final, you can just use it directly in your try block. So you save yourself typing all these extra variables and make it more clear, clearer of what you're trying to do. Okay, so that's one of, these, these are type of changes that you can put into the language without breaking all the compatibilities or having new class form and things like that. And they're always really welcome this type of changes. So if you have any um, annoying little things in the Java languages that sort of like, you know, that want to change, do propose it to the community and um, we can actually take it, we can actually implement them in sort of a major version of Java. Okay, so that was one of the example. The second thing that they introduced in Java 9 is um, private interface methods, okay? So in the, so, so in the top, that's basically the Java 7 and Java 8 um, days. So let's say if you want to, um, let's say animals, they can eat or sneeze, and they both use the mouth, okay? So they both open the mouth, so you can think of it as a, like a common method. Um, if, you, if you have default methods in those interfaces, you can't actually create a private sort of like, you know, share implementations. So both of them like have to do open mouth and things like that, right? Um, so in Java 9, what, what they allow you to do is declare private methods inside your interfaces. So that allows you to actually factor out all the common uh, methods into private methods and you can call them just like you normally do um, in, in, in your code. So it makes it a lot cleaner and you don't repeat yourself, right? Um, so what happens is that you can have private static methods and you can have private sort of like instance method, but you can't have a private abstract and def default method. It makes no sense, okay? Um, so those are the those are the new uh, methods that you can now have in the interfaces. Uh, anybody uses Java eight default methods in the code at the moment? Yeah, a few. 
Yeah, um, and I think I think it's very useful to it, it. It was kind of developed as a bridge for the older Java uh, older code that might not have all the um, interfaces before. For um, when when they move to Java eight, when you have streams and things like that, and I think people find it even more useful for um, all the other things outside of the uh, uh, streams and iterations and things like that. Um, so. Um, there's a couple of streams and collection update, and I think the uh, the really important thing here is that they added some of the uh, missing methods. Um, so, for example, there's a drop while and tick tick while. So, if you so if I so if I um, copy that, so drop while is basically say if you have a stream and you want to stop it process any further then basically it would it would actually um, it, would, it would actually stop the processing okay so if we stick that in there okay so um, so drop while is basically say okay if I don't meet this condition if the element didn't meet this condition don't do anything okay just uh, skip it and only start and passing the element after the condition is met. So let's say I've got a uh, odd numbers, and then basically I say drop, drop while n is seven. So basically that will give me any um, um, elements that's larger than seven. Well, le yeah, less than seven. So larger or equals to seven. So this is what is print. So so only print seven, nine, eleven. Okay. And then the reverse, you can have obviously you, if you have drop while, then you you have a reverse. So basically, the tick while is basically the reverse of it. It's so basically, if the condition is true, then you basically keep the element until the condition become false. Okay. So so obviously, if we if I do tick while, then basically it become one three five because it's less than seven. Okay. So any element it only gives you the element less than seven. Okay. So this this very useful when you um, because without those methods, you have to do filters and collects and things like that. It must just make it really, really bad to read, but that, that cleans it up, okay. Um, the other thing that, um, the in, uh, interesting things that they've implemented is a new iterate, uh, uh, overridden iterate method. So now you can write something similar to how you would do a for stream, uh, so a for loop. So you have to initialize it, you say the condition, and then you say what happened after each loop. So it makes it very easy. So in, in uh, previously you have to you probably have to do it in a couple of steps, um, and now you can actually do it like a normal how you would like write a for loop, which is pretty good. Uh, and finally, they have implement a factory method for fixed collections. So let's say you have already have a fixed sort of like you know all the elements of your collections. What you can do is you can now call list off uh, and map off. Um, so you create a map and and. They, they've actually implemented two ways of map off, which I think is, is quite uh, uh, in interesting. So it's obviously people prefer probably to say, so like map off how many apps, so let's say this is a way of storing how many apples or oranges, you, uh, fruits you have. So you say apple is one element, then orange is two, banana is three of them. Um, people, that, that, looks, that looks natural to the people, then the bottom way, I guess the this way is probably quite natural to people, um, but sometimes you probably have sort of like you know, probably easier if you want to just use the if entry method, and then basically you can just create entry like that. Sometimes it's cleaner doing the second way, but either way, you can act now actually do that instead of having to map dot add and then dot add dot add. Okay. Okay, so we have done some languages. We have done some reactive API. Um, now you now introduce so many new things in the JDK. We've got different libraries. If you are a library developer, if you write um, Tomcat or whatever, and you want to provide things, uh, and obviously now that you've seen all these great features in JDK nine, and you want to provide it to users, um, but you still have got lots of people using Java six, Java seven, Java eight. You can't have a single jar that actually support both at the mo um, before Java 9 comes along. You have to create different jars, so one for Java 6 client, one for Java 7 client, etc. right? Which is terrible. 
Um, so in Java 9, they support something called the multi-release jar. Um, so now you can actually just pack, package up your wonderful library into one jar, um, and then you just add all the extra uh, stuff for your different version of Java. Okay, so for example, if I, um, if I provide this Hello World class, okay, and then I've got something that only works for Java 6, um, or, or, or both, so I've just put the Java 6 implementation in the root directory, and then what happens is that in um, you can uh, newer version of Maven and Gradle will allows you to uh, generate this multi-release jar, and then what what happens is that you've just put your new version of Java library in the um, first meta in versions directory. You can provide Java 9 implementation, Java 10 implementations, and what happens in the class loader is that when it load the class, it will say, "Oh, I am Java 9 implementation, so I can actually use JDK 9 classes." And then it will actually use all the classes in the versions 9 directory. Um, you can be the same name as well. You can override, override the method. I didn't show it in this example. But you can override, have, have a Java 6 implementation or whatever implementation in Java, uh, the versions 9 directory that override the behavior. And then what happens is that if you run this jar in the older version of, um, uh, older version of JDK, you only see the top bit. You only see this bit. So, this is the bits that you only see if you use older JDK. If you use new Java 9, you only see those disk classes and lay on top of disk classes. So what happens is that now you can actually just have one jar, but you provide multiple implementations for different versions of Java, okay? Which is, uh, I think it's really, really good. So it saves yourself all this disk space and things like that. Okay. Um, so we've done most of the libraries and things like that. Um, I want to shift the focus a little bit closer to the JVM, um, and then I'll give you some ideas of how um, some of the changes that they made. Um, so these changes that you're going to see in the next couple of slices doesn't require any changes from, from your code. There's no change in your code. You don't have to rewrite your classes to take advantage of it, okay? So the first thing, um, I want to talk about is the interval string concat. Um, so I've, I presume, so what happened if you have a string and then you go a string A plus string B? Anybody tell me, tell me what happened? Just make sure you are not asleep. <laughs> Anybody knows? What will happen if you've got two string A and B, you plus them together, what, what, what happened? Yeah? Right, so so in the compile, Java compiler, it in in the old versions, it will actually just do string builder append. Okay, this is what what it shows. This is an old version of Java. It do string builder append, right? So you use string string builder, and then you append a, and then you append b. So that's a plus b concat, right? Um, and in fact, in Java four uh, one four two before they introduced string builder, they use string. Um, uh, they use string append, there's another a string buffer, right? The difference between string buffer and string builder is that string buffer is synchronized, so it would be slower. Um, now, you can see that, obviously, as new technology, so the string builder comes along, you would actually want to use a different thing. But then, if you use Java, older version of Java C, compile your classes, you are fixed to string buffer or string builder, right? It doesn't change. So, and the JDK developer thing, well, hmm, that's not very good. So if I comes along with some wonderful x86 instructions that makes it 10 times faster, I can't make use of it, okay? So now, what they did is they changed the generator code. So instead of hard coding the string builder in older versions, they changed it to, um, if, it looks better if you on, look on your screen. So they, instead of doing that, it actually changes using an invoke dynamic instructions. That invoke dynamic instructions allow the runtime to actually bind the different methods uh, in, in, in the runtime instead of fixing. So if you use compile with Java 4, it has to be, on 4.2, it has to be a string buffer. If you use Java 5 or 6 or 7, you have a string builder. That's no longer the case. In Java 9, it will basically um, use the, the runtime can provide different methods. So I don't know, uh, string super do the buffer or whatever. Uh, that comes along, and then they can actually make use of it without any things that you recompile, okay? And so this is one of the things that they 
changes underneath and you probably wouldn't notice. So if you compile, recompile your code with Java 9, Java C, you, you can take advantage of that. Okay, so at the moment, the Java 9 implementations have, uh, have a similar string buffer implementations, but later on, they are planning to put in intrinsic so they can make use of the x86 um, instructions. Um, okay, so that's one example. So the Indify uh, string concat, that's one example that um, they, they kind of try to implement things that um, sort of like the JVM and, and the J class library itself, implement things that doesn't um, uh, sort of like, you know, uh, improve your performance without actually you doing anything. And that's one of the wonderful things about Java. So if you compile your C and C++, your code is fixed and you can't really take advantage of any um, sort of like improvement come, coming along, right? Okay, so the next uh, interesting things they put in Java 9 is called compact strings. Again, this is one of the feature that does not involve any code changes. If you run your code in Java 9, the existing class library, it's already doing it for you, okay? Um, so in Java, strings is UTF-16. 16 is actually the number of bits. So 16 bits is two bytes. So each character, whether it's English or whether it's Chinese in Unicode or whatever, is two bytes. Okay, so that's not very efficient. Um, I I don't know about sort of like you know, I don't know whether people write uh, print comments in or or, or print sort of like lock messages in Chinese, but I suspect most people are probably still doing it in English, right? And it's very inefficient to store something that takes one byte into two, right? So it's extra extra space that you have to do. So this compact string implementation. What happens is that um, in the in in the hotspot VM and in the class library, it will detect whether the string that you put together, whether it's Chinese or whether it's just English. If it's just Latin based or so English, so eight eight five nine one or Latin one, so that's one byte per character, um, the ASCII basically. If it's ASCII, it will actually instead of storing it in two bytes, it will just store it in one byte. Okay. So how does that translate? So it's basically 20% faster because you don't have to go through double bytes and you don't put as much pressure in the cache. 30% um, less storage in the general log messages. Um, so but obviously, if you print your log messages in Chinese, it's not going to help you. But if you print your log messages in English, that's, um, that, that you, you can observe that. And I, I think the majority is um, uh, sort of like the code is doing that. I think I've uh, got five minutes. Um, corner cases. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip the stack walking. Um, so if I've got five minutes, um, I'm going to s um, I'll quickly go for fan handles. I think that's quite interesting as well. Um, everybody use Invoke Dynamic API, the method handles in Java 7, Java 8 before? Yeah, it's quite advanced, right? Um, what happens is that the method handles allows you to bind, uh, as, I, as we saw in the um, string concatenation changes, it allows you to dynamically bind different methods at runtime. Okay, uh, One of the things that you couldn't do um, before Java 9 is that you can't actually encapsulate the instruction to say, well, I want to change a class variable in one atomic uh, changes and things like that. Okay, So in Java 9, they introduced something called var handles which allows you to actually do atomic uh, updates and fence updates and things like that for um, variables. So you can say a class variables, you can actually get the var handles, um, and then you can actually do things to it like reflection for uh, variables. What do you use it for? Um, the, they, they actually allows you to implement things like off heap um, data storage. So if you are using um, so all those memory grid and things like that, they use um, off heap storage so that you don't have to do garbage collection and things like that. This API allows you to as very standard and safe interfaces for you to actually access those. Um, so if you have library writers that do sort of like a native memory access, this is something that would interest you. Okay, but most developer probably um, sort of like a, perhaps if you are doing a lot of reflective access in class variables, this is very interesting, and it's a lot faster than re reflection. 
because this is um, basically a hotspot in, um, can actually optimize it um, by looking at the, all the access. Okay. Um, so we've done talking about a lot about all the um, sort of like you know, interface changes and things like that. So the next couple of slides is we're talking about stuff that done in hotspot that change and um, that improves things. And again, no cook changes required. Just run it in Java 9, and then you, you can take advantage of it. Okay. Um, so the GC logs has changed. In the old days, um, anybody actually collect GC logs in production? Right, great. Um, it's, it's, if you actually haven't done it, it's very useful. We recommend it to all our developers and applications. Um, it helps you to do analysis afterwards. If you have a sort of out-of-memory error and things like that, you have got no idea whether this GC is slow or whether it's, you've got a memory leak. The GC log just tells you quite a lot of things. So it's, if you haven't done it in production, do consider sort of like um, collect the um, GC logs. Um, in JDK 9, all of those have changed. They now have a common framework, so like the uh, Apache locking frameworks and things like that. So instead of that, then it, it does it for the JVM. Okay, um, so the, the difference to you is basically um, there are slightly different calls. So if you do print GC details before, you have to change your calls to something slightly else. Um, so I'll show it in here. Um, going forward, what happened is that it, uh, it allows you to actually do more filtering to specific things. So they have got different tags for different GC events. And you can do further filtering. So if you know which bits of GCs of like, no, I don't know, concurrent phase or whatever, you know something has gone wrong and you want to just focus on those uh, log files, then you can actually tune it down and filter it. And the other thing is that it's got the proper rotations and things like that um, in, 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 in GC logging as well now. So um, that's, and going forward, when they put in new logging into JVM components, they're going to use this framework. So it makes it a lot easier for you to control and lock them. All right, I've been told that I've uh, run out of time. So um, I, think, um, I think I've shown you some sort of quite interesting stuff in, in the JVM. I haven't got time to go through all of them, so feel free to come and ask me anything that shows there, but you can take a look at the slides, okay? Um, so any questions or? Hi, Sonny. Excuse me. Uh, you said raw handles. Uh, uh, you, you, you use this the, the handle, but uh, without declare the, the type of the variable. Okay, it's uh, is is this using uh type inference or how 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 do it to guess what type it, it you uh, um you 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 so you, you, you know, no so no you theory, you no. you you know you have to, you need to look it up. So what yes. happens that in this in this method handles lookup, you actually have to provide the exact class that you want to reflect name and okay. the Into class of the variables. Class. Okay, I see. So, so you have to say, so you, yeah. your, your test.class have to have a variable name called A, and it has to be an integer. If anything's wrong, okay, it will I throw an exception. Thank you. So, so, so this is not, this is not um, well, obviously, it allows you to do, um, this is also provided for language writers. So if you're implementing JavaScript in in Java, if you want to do that, you can actually dynamically change this. And, and but obviously, you have to check and make sure that it's not wrong. But it's it still allows you some sort of like you know, dynamicity. But it still prevents you to do dodgy things like storing a flow into uh, into an integer. So this will for exception if if it's not int. Okay, I see. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm afraid time's up, so feel free to come and ask me a question afterwards. Um, thank you for listening. <laughs>